What's going on guys, this is Pete. In today's video, we're gonna be discussing two of the biggest challenges for the aspiring poker player. Firstly, the mindset that you get into before a session is so important to how good your decisions are likely to be during that session. So you're gonna see me do a pre-game routine before I sit down at the 200 Zoom tables and get the cards in the air. Secondly, I'm gonna be talking about structure of thought process. This is a very big obstacle for poker students to get over and having a disorganized poker thought process can sometimes be extremely costly to your win rate and your decision making quality. Let's get into the session and I'll show you exactly how to fix these two things. Well guys, you found me down at one of my favorite places. That's right, it's the edge of the 200 zoom pool. I'm gonna be getting my toes into the water very shortly and we're gonna be doing battle with some tough competition on a Wednesday morning here in what is a, a very solid game full of good players. So looking forward to this, but before we jump in and get the cards into the air, it's very important that we go through our mental game checklist to make sure that our mindset is correct in order to play our A game and not our F game. There's quite a big difference, right? First out of four of the things that I want you guys to go through in your pre-game warm-up is calmness. If you imagine that one out of 10 here is something like a very still pond with no ripples in the water at all, and 10 is like the choppiest sea that you can possibly imagine with waves everywhere and just throth and, and a very unpleasant place to be in a boat, you would want to be closer to one, closer to the sort of still lake. I want my brain to be a little bit energized. I want enough energy such that I'm ready to charge myself up for the spots that poker's gonna throw at me, but I don't want so much energy that I'm already on my fourth cup of coffee and totally amped and wired and just gonna be scattered and all over the place. So check in with yourself. How calm do you feel? Are you worried about anything? Are you overly agitated, angry, or excited or frustrated? These are symptoms that indicate that you need to bring your calmness level down a bit towards the zero, towards the still lake. And if on the other hand, you're tired, lethargic, sluggish, then you need to raise it up a little bit. Aim for a 3.5, something like that out of 10. That's gonna set you up nicely so that you're not burning through too much energy, but you're also in the right state of mind to energize yourself where needed. For live players, this is really difficult to regulate because poker live will throw you large periods of downtime. I guess for us online guys, it's a bit easier because we are going to be kept in the loop by frequently being bombarded with decisions. Okay, point number two is emptiness. Picture a unicorn with pink wings flying over a volcano. <laughs> a bit weird, right? But how easily can you picture that right now if you close your eyes and imagine it? Are there other things coming into the picture? Is your brain being swept away by other thoughts? This is basically how ready you're gonna to be to focus and zoom in on only the thing in front of you, which is the poker decision that has to be solved. This is also going to be a good testament to how easily you can stick to a good logical thought process with clear steps rather than getting distracted and wandering off the beaten track. It, we're going to talk about this in, in part two of the video, but one of the biggest problems students go through is this wandering thought process. They, they do know roughly what they should be thinking about, but in the heat of battle, they just end up getting distracted. There's too many thoughts in their brain. So where's your emptiness level? Your mind should be very empty before a poker session, but not in a way where it's just completely glazed over and about to fall asleep, but more in a sort of sense that you're just, you have this blank stage and you're ready to put something on the stage and give some thought process the limelight at any time, because that's what poker requires of you, right? Throws you a random big pot out of nowhere and suddenly you need all of your attention on that hand. Thirdly, inspiration. One of the biggest pitfalls in mindset in poker, in my opinion, and one of the things I teach my mental game students on the most is keeping the charge up in their sort of what I call the grit cycle, the cycle that keeps them continuing and putting in volume and playing well, studying, keeps them energized and motivated, right? But the ignition to this, like the spark that begins the fire of being an energized and committed poker player is inspiration. So think back to why you've most recently started putting in lots of volume and study hours. What's been the drive for you? For some people, it could be something really simple, like just trying to get an extra five to 10K a year to book nice holidays or something like that. For others, it might be trying to make six figures at the poker table. For others, it may not be monetarily related at all. And it might just be something like trying to prove themselves in a very challenging 
and competitive intellectual arena. So whatever it is for you, try and channel that right now and feel a little spark of that original drive. That'll keep you very motivated and it'll keep you performing at your best throughout the course of your session. Fourthly and finally, I want to touch on discipline. A lack of discipline allows you to get swept up by more emotional thought processes. It allows desires to creep in and make decisions for you, which is never a thing we want as poker players, right? If we want that elusive A game to be our level of performance. So what we need to do is maybe just imagine ourselves getting distracted by something. It could be a temptation outside of poker, like for me, firing up a five minute chess game right now instead of recording this YouTube video would be a very silly thing to do, but it's something that part of my brain is like, yeah, yeah, do that, do that. How would you feel right now about temptation? How strong does your willpower and mental fortitude seem to you? If it's not strong enough, try and refocus, try and remember why it's so important to stay disciplined at the poker table and just make sure that that sort of sledgehammer of willpower is ready to go and it's ready to smite all of these thought processes that try to lead you astray, like anger, anxiety, desires, feeling attached to pots, whatever it may be, just how ready is that sort of parent part of your brain, not punitive, in any way, not sort of criticizing yourself or, or giving yourself a hard time, but how ready is that to step in and look after you and make sure you don't get swept up by these bad thought processes. So let's reiterate our four cornerstones of a pre-game mindset warm-up. Firstly, we have calmness. You want to be about a 3, 3.5 out of 10 on that scale, much closer to just being stoic and focused than agitated and, and eager. Secondly, you want to have a lot of emptiness in your head, but not in a vacant glazed over way, but just in a way where you've cleared the stage for the thought process that you need to put there when poker throws that big pot your way. Thirdly, inspiration. Do you feel like your session has a real purpose or are you just going through the motions? If it's the latter, try to reconnect with that thing that got you into the game in the first place. Try and make that empower you once again. And fourthly, discipline. Do you feel ready to step in and intervene if you're tempted to get swept away by some sort of maybe desire-based or emotional-based thought process? How good a job are you gonna do of keeping yourself on the straight and narrow and doing what you know is right for your game? All right, without any further ado, let's get some cards in the air and I'll show you guys how to keep a structure now to your thought process. And off we go, let's get the cards into the air here. I actually have two tables ready to go, as we can see. Loving the new colors on PokerStars here. Really enjoying the ability to create all of these different themes and stuff. Call me a saddo, but I really love aesthetics. I think they're super important. Working on a nice desk, you know, with a, with a big monitor and a fish tank next to me is much more motivating to me than playing my poker out of a, of a cupboard and a, a tiny little screen on a laptop or something like that. So I really think environment matters. And I think like how you make your tables look is, is a cool thing as well that, that can also motivate you. So as we get into hands here today, I'm just going to show you like the full session with very little editing. We're going to discuss just like we would on a stream, a logical thought process for each spot that we actually get into. So you'll see this table jump about a bit between hands as we go. So ace six, very close, but going to be one of the suited aces that we actually fold, small blind versus button. There won't be many of these. King four, we're going to go ahead and actually open here. And when I get to the first post flop spot, I want to talk to you guys about how it's actually going to work. So with a hand like king four suited, we don't mind having a little bit of four bet with these hands if we want. We can go sort of 10% with all of these king x holdings and that keeps our frequency down a little bit. The four is not actually a bad card to have there. Queen jack, we can mix a bit of three bet here as well. We do roll it this time. Excuse the clicking, I'm, I'm clicking up with my mouse there because I don't have a hotkey set up right now for that sizing. And well, as soon as we get post flop here, what we're gonna do is basically slow right down and actually I'll very deliberately go through the thought process that I'm going to be deploying. Pocket sevens is a spot we may well get into. I'm going to actually start by just pure peeling here rather than, than doing anything else. I'm not gonna be three betting the spot squeezing the spot. One reason for that is that this, this stack can jam sometimes, which is horrible for sevens. Secondly, it's just not much of a theoretical squeeze spot in the first place. Going to just be pure call. Obviously, building flatting ranges in the small blind is something you should be willing to do if the situation calls for it. Fairly unfamiliar spot to me facing squeeze in this situation. I think this is just going to become a bit of a implied odds kind of calculation here. There will be the odd time that we win this pot without a set, but we're gonna need a set the majority of the time, depending on what happens here. So when this player calls, if this guy calls as well, 
we have 11 here. That means that our average gain is going to need to be about 110, 110 big blinds, something like that. I think that's actually not that difficult to do in this situation. And the will, and the reason for that is that the pot's already going to be about 42 big blinds here. So step one, implied odds target, I need to be getting back about 110 big blinds. But because pot's already 42, I only need to make like another 68 or something like that on average. And as this is such a lucrative situation with three players, one of them being recreational, I think we can easily make another sort of 60, 70 big blinds on average with a set here. Maybe more, we might even be pushing up at about 75 to 80 average big blind gain here. So our thought process there was very orderly. We were basically like, okay, gearing ourselves up, getting ready for the spot, understanding that this was going to become a situation where implied odds calculation was the main thought process. Then we defined a target as we flop a set about one in 10, one in 11 times, we used what I call the 10X rule, which is a way of measuring how much money we need to get back. We then realized that because there was so much money in the pot already, we didn't need to get that much back. Later on, we just had to make like another 60-ish um, big blinds in order to get up to that 110 target. And then we realized that because of the situation, because we were three way with a weaker short stack player in the hand, it was very likely we'd be able to do that. So remember there, guys, it's all about getting the right structure of thought process first and then going from there. If your thought process was, is sevens a call in a GTO chart in this spot, it would have the wrong question, right? It's like if you want to go to the shop and you want to buy milk, you need to be asking yourself, well, where is the shop? Do I have money on me? How much does milk cost? Can I afford the milk? These sort of questions. Asking yourself what kind of cows make the best milk would be a really silly question. It would have nothing to do with you going to the shop to getting milk or making that possible, right? So try to make sure that your thought process is about to go down the right path before you actually commit to that thought process. If you're asking yourself the wrong questions, you're very likely going to get a correct answer that's just a useless correct answer, right? So... Asking the right questions is, is so key there. Let's see if we can get into a few more spots now. So queen four here, I believe this hand to be really close. Will I be three betting a suited queen in this situation? I think we probably can three bet bluff hands like this occasionally. I think maybe this one is pure call actually. And like suited king X, um, slightly bigger suited queens like queen eight, queen nine are gonna be more, more three bettable. Um, over on this table, we have six eight here. We're gonna peel against a weaker player. We don't really flop anything on either of those spots. Here's a good example of a completely parallel situation. We have two pr turn probe situations. So with turn probe, I'm gonna define my sizing and that's gonna be a big bet on this table where the nine is possible and an over bet on this table here. In both of these situations, I'm going to be playing a protocol where I have a certain minimum standard for leading these turn spots. Really cool that these both came up at the same time and neither of these hands is going to qualify for that minimum standard. So we're actually going to be folding the queen four. This spot here, I'm just gonna be rolling for sizing and I have as many different sizes as I actually use here. I think eight, six is a hand I'm gonna be bluffing really frequently. We'll take a look at that river protocol there. I didn't quite have enough time to spell out exactly the structure of my thought process there, but I'm going to show you guys the structure. Although I wasn't able to articulate it in time, there was a very distinct flow to my thought process there and it was mapped out with a few key steps. So what I'd like to do is just show you that. And while we're at it, we may as well talk a little bit about the turn situation as well and the thought process that I was using there. This is all about structure this video, right? So it's super important that we give ourselves the maximum organization. So we call the preflop structure here as do I want to be three betting this hand at any frequency? And the answer is no, I just know this from theory job done, check flop, that's my structure, I just check everything on this board, villain checks back. My structure here is that I will lead for over bets only and I will be using strong value hands that'll be sometimes check raising and sometimes over betting and then using certain draws and semi bluffs. The reason that I have to impose that only draws are better standard on my range here is that my range sucks, right? My opponent's doing far better than I am even after checking back flop and so I need to be leading at minimum here gutter with diamond blocker and probably mostly flush draw and open ender with bluffs and then using strong hands something like ace queen ace 10 plus for value here probably more ace queen plus against early position 
So given I'm playing that way, I just know that I can check all of the weaker aces, jack x, tens, nine x, pocket eights, um, hands like this, and also check air like eight, six or king, four of clubs or, or something like that. So there's a very clear structure there. Define sizing, define hand selection, see where the hand fits in, right, very orderly. This is what you want your thought process to look like one day. It won't be the case that you can just orchestrate this immediately and have this kind of structure, but eventually this is possible with enough practice. We then come to the river spot. Villain decides to check back the turn a second time, and now we have a spot where we need to, again, define structure. So first off is going to be the question of what is my hand doing? Is this a mandatory check, or is this a hand that's pure bluffing, or is this a hand that's mixing bluffing? So the first question is, do I mix bluff, pure bluff, or pure check? I think when I have a card like a six in my hand and an eight, it's probably not fantastic. But I also noted here that I, I have spades, I don't have clubs or something. People are going to bet clubs less here than the other suits. So if there's one I actually want to give up here, it's probably clubs. So I figure with six, eight of spades, I would just pure attack here with this particular suit and this these low cards aren't going to block a lot of my opponent's folding range. A lot of my opponents fold the range here will be like king 10, king queen, things like this. Yeah, there's some combos of sixes and eights. It's not great to block them. But I think that the low cards here are going to be some of the better ones to bluff rather than king high, queen high that are going to block a lot of folds. So I decided that first off, in order to answer the first question, and yeah, all of this happens in like five seconds, guys. I've just got it down, right? It's just a lot of practice. To answer the first question of do I bluff this hand, I just decided yes, pure. The next thing I did with four seconds on my clock is I thought, which sizes will be in my toolkit here. I decided that I would have a lot of block bet because I have many thin value hands such as jack x, 9x, something like that. I just want to block here, pocket tens, the pocket potatoes as we call them. And then of course we have some bigger hands like ace 10, ace 8, ace 5, etc. A region that probably wants to big bet and that would be about a b75. That's not that many combos though, so I'm not assigning too many roles to that on my RNG, which you guys can't see, it's off screen. Thirdly, I'm gonna have an overbet because I will still get here with some combos of four or five that I was gonna check raise on turn maybe, some combos of pocket threes, some combos of ace three, ace jack, ace nine, pocket nines, pocket jacks, pocket deuces. All of these hands are check raising turn rather than betting turn at some frequency, right? We talked about that in our turn protocol. And then on the river, then we're going to have a lot of overbets here as well. We're actually allowed to allocate more of our bluffs into our overbet range because that sizing is bigger and gives Villain a more severe equity target for calling. That means that he needs to win more often by calling and therefore we can actually make him win more often by calling by bluffing at higher frequency for the bigger sizes than we would for the smaller sizes. Hopefully that makes sense. So with this hand, I actually rolled a 10 out of 100, which is a very aggressive action for me. If I rolled a 0 out of 100, that's the most aggressive, and a 99 is the most passive. Uh, it's only two digits on the, the RNG display, right? So we have 0 instead of 100, but whatever. It's still 100 numbers. I digress. This hand is going to be an overbet on that roll. We overbet villain folds. No problem. There's a whole other kind of worms we could open up here with an exploitative thought process. And, you know, you guys can do that if you want. But I would say that getting the, the theory down first and knowing how you'd be thinking ordinarily is going to be very important to do before actually getting lost in the, the weeds of exploitative thinking. So to reiterate, our river thought process was our hand will be a pure bluff due to its blockers and its low cards on blocking king and queen high. We're going to be using either 33, 75 or 150, but without that much 75, mostly the other two. And then we rolled a number that's low enough that it definitely puts us in the overbet camp this time. It's not important which sizing we use this time. What's important is that we just have order to our thought process instead of chaos. All right, let's play some more. I just played another hand here, guys, which is not what I was going to include. I was basically just setting up the tables again after taking a quick break. But basically what happened here was I was in the big blind and I flatted ace nine suited. My preflop protocol is just a pure call this hand. This is one that I don't actually three bet. I do mix three bet with most suited aces, but this one is a bit too mediocre. So we call and we face a flop of jack deuce deuce and villain c bet small. I don't believe this hand is going to do any raise, but my protocol here is facing flop c bet would be, am I mixing call and raise? Am I folding? Am I pure calling? Just trying to decide the mix of my hand. I decided this hand was just a pure call with the backdoor flush draw and showdown value and fairly good pair draws against cutoffs range as well. I made the call. So turn goes check, check, and this is now a bet, check, bet spot. Interestingly, the fourth diamond comes in the river, which makes us top pair. 
and immediately my protocol goes to is this a small value bet or is this a check or is this a mix of small value bet and check now this is quite an interesting one i was just talking about exploits and whether you should actually do a theoretical protocol or an exploitative protocol or both and i think the answer to that is that you should start off with a theoretical protocol and if you have time and you feel like you're up to it and you've got actually like a really good idea about how the spot is played exploitatively, you can then add a layer of exploitative thought process to that as well. So what I'm going to do here is I'm going to show you firstly a theoretical protocol and secondly an exploitative protocol and how to put the two together. You always want to do them in that order, theory first, exploits second. So villain goes ahead here. We did actually decide to check here. And um, before we get to what he's gone ahead and done, we'll talk about this decision whether to bet or whether to check theoretically and then exploitatively. So firstly, I do believe that the hand is able to make a very small block bet here if it wants to. I think it would have to be incredibly small, like maybe 15% pot, something like that. And it could probably either do that or check. So the theory is that I could either make a very small bet or check here. The exploitative part of the thought process is actually that we don't want to be going too thin for value in spots where pool is likely to overfold. I actually think, well, I actually know I teach an exploitative course right now. And while I don't want to give away all of the secrets of that course, I'll let you guys into a little bit of insight for free because, you know, I care about you guys, my YouTube audience as well. But there's two exploitative things here that are really cool. One is that small bets tend to be very overfolded too, just by general population. It's just hard to meet the very high defense frequency that comes with facing small bets here. Villain's probably going to have to make some very bizarre bluff catches sometimes here to 15 or 20% pot, such as jack 10 of clubs and, and things like that, right? And that's not everyone's cup of tea. Some people are folding 40, 50% in spots that are only meant to be folding 20. This can definitely happen with certain regs and, and weaker players especially. So that aside though, the other exploitative thing that really matters here is that bet check bet on this sort of spot where, where the four flush comes on the river is actually really over bluffed. And the reason for that is that people are not very good at delaying their aggression here with a value hand they tend to bet a lot of their value hands on the turn in fact too many of them and they tend to bet too often with one diamond on the turn and not often enough with two clubs or two spades or something like that so effectively their turn c bet range is way too strong and way too diamond heavy therefore when turn actually checks through like it does here what's happening is that the opponent's very likely to over bluff so i very quickly snapped this river bet this is an incredibly over bluffed line in general the reason being that villain is only meant to be bluffing about well he's bet half pot right so we need 25 percent equity that means that 75 percent of our opponent's range here is meant to be a value bet that's just very unlikely in reality to be happening and so we have a very easy call the queen nine of clubs is the epitome of the sort of hand that probably should bet turn occasionally but doesn't king queen of clubs is another one that sort of thing. I just think people are not strengthening their turn checking range sufficiently here to avoid over bluffing the river for these kind of sizes. So if we think the next node, the next decision point that's to say is going to be over bluffed, like he's going to be bluffing too often, we actually want to check more of these mediocre hands and reject the small bet option. Moreover, we rejected the small bet option here because we don't think our opponent will pay it off enough, but we think he'll bet too often with random hands like this and have too air heavy a range of check to so that's how our protocol went there. There was a theoretical one and then there was an exploitative one and you've got to do them in that order. So hopefully you guys can see that there's a lot more order and logical flow to my thought process than you might think in real time. There's actually a lot of steps going on and I try to make sure that I'm following the right protocol, the right blueprint of thought process before I answer my questions. All right, let's play another spot or two. Here we have another example of protocol, guys, a hand that just came up. So ace queen here, we open the button, we get a call by the big blind, really standard stuff. 993, so question one in my protocol here is going to be what is my global bet frequency? Global refers to the amount of the time that my range is betting and that's a very useful marker or reference point because if I know how often my range is betting, I can figure out how often to then bet my hand. So the idea here is that 993 two tone, meaning of the flush draw, is a fairly favorable spot for me. I'm in position, I probably wanna do a lot of betting. I'll also decide at the start of my protocol here whether I'll use a big bet or a small one. What do you guys think? Pause the video, try and work it out. Well, the answer is small bet. 
because on 993 our opponent's going to have a much more uncapped range than normal, a much more polarized range than normal, and we just don't have the big nut advantage that usually drives our big sizing like we would have on unpaired flop of this nature, like 9-3 deuce, that's a board I'd be betting bigger on. So my global frequency, how often my range is betting, probably more of the time than not, I would say like 65-70% of the time. Does my hand bet more or less often than that? I think less, and the reason for that is that this hand is pretty good at just showing down, it's fairly mediocre. It's a bit better than mediocre though, betting is definitely fine here, and I would probably bet about 40 or 50% of the time with this hand, and about 60 to 70% with range. Then I look at the RNG, I see what it tells me to do this time. No exploitative thought here necessary, I check back. Villain bets one third pot on the turn. It's a bit of a weird way to play the nine of spades turn in all honesty, I mean I guess you can do this and you can build a, a small probe range here, you can also build a bigger bet too if you wanted to. It's a very bad turn in general for his range because we're just going to have a higher pair density on this sort of node, but that said our protocol is going to be very much about whether our hand is a raise, call or fold or mix, so it's going to start with that. This hand is just clearly a call, it's a very very good boat draw with immediate showdown value, I don't think there's any reason to do anything else here. Villain checks the river and our protocol will then say can we value bet. The reason I wouldn't ask can we bluff here is that it's totally absurd, this hand is so strong that it's miles away from bluffing, it's much closer to value betting than bluffing, therefore the right question to ask here structurally is can I value bet. I think the answer is no. I don't think that if I skip to an exploitative thought process here, I don't think enough ace high just check calls this node in general or bets turn. So I just think that this hand is a very clear check. We check, we lose the deuces, job done and can't win them all. All right, let's play another spot. So hopefully you guys like the fact that I'm bringing this to you in real time-ish. I mean, I, I could have gone over hands and solvers here and shown you exactly what they were doing or whatever, but I want to actually demonstrate how you apply a thought process like this in real life. It's very easy to sit and stare at a solver output and be like, do this because of this, do this because of this, but it's not going to be the best way to go. 3.5x here, this is actually really close with Queen9. I'm actually going to go ahead and make a kind of non-standard play here in 3-bet. This is an exploitative play, and my thought process basically goes as follows. Anyone that 3.5x's is a recreational player. Recreational players don't 4-bet a very wide range. When they do 4-bet, they go massive like this, and they have a really strong hand, and we just get out of the way. But in general there, we get 4-bet a lot less by a recreational player than we do by a regular, and therefore I actually think that we can just stretch out our 3-bet range a little bit more. What we don't want to do is assume that just because recreational players are also a bit sticky to 3-bet, so that's a very bad thing. Yes, they might fold a little bit less than a regular does there. They'll still fold. But the point is that when they don't 4-bet you enough, they don't 4-bet bluff you or anything like that, you actually just do really well by getting to realize a ton of your equity. So I think Queen-9 there is, is easily good enough. King-Queen, my protocol is going to be, I think, mostly 3-bet with a bit of call. Let's go like 60-40. So again, just trying to decide the frequency before I roll the RNG, before I actually play my hand. I think that's super important for protocol. This is something that, shout out to Clanty, aka Luke Johnson, someone that I've worked with in the past has actually got me to do, which was to stop just clicking an RNG and then estimating what my hand should do, and rather decide on a strategy first, like I'm going to bet this hand about this amount of the time for excising and then roll it. It just really organizes your thought process and makes you way more of a sort of GTO killer. So yeah, shout out to Luke for that, that gem, that nugget of wisdom. You can see some videos of Luke Johnson playing some high stakes on this channel if you go back in time a little bit to to the beginning of 2022, end of 2021, you'll see him battling at 510 and, and doing similar kind of thought processes to this. Right, so let's just continue here and just see if we can get into a couple more spots before we round off the video. I don't actually think it's very important. You know, you might be thinking, Pete, these spots suck, they're boring. It's not really about playing big pots today. It's showing you guys the nitty gritty grind of having a good thought process. Ace queen here. I am going to go ahead and normally I'd be mixing call with 3-bet on this node, but because this is a weaker player and like I say, we don't get 4-bet very often by weaker players and it's more valuable to isolate them. The exploit here, and this is an exploit, this 3-bet, and the reason it's an exploit is that I did it all of the time. I didn't mix any call in here. This is hilarious. Like Poker is basically like, Pete, everything you say, I'm going to disprove you by making the thing happen that you say never happens. Easy fold. But yeah, it'll do that sometimes. Like just because I got three bet, I got four bet twice in a row there by recreationals does not disprove that over very large samples they will not be four betting me enough, right? 
don't judge a statement by two occurrences of feedback. They're not real feedback. That's the point. Okay, protocol time. A6-4. Not going to bet this flop all that often. The 6 and the 4 are good for villain. The ace is polarizing to his range. I'll say globally 35% here in hand. I think I can, we can bet this maybe a bit more. I'm going to say 50% for my hand. And the reason I want to assign a protocol that bets this hand more often than my range is that it's got very good backdoor straight draws, two backdoor flush draw blockers, basically unblocking the dead suit there, which was hearts, allowing my opponent to fold at a bit of a higher frequency by increasing his heart heart prevalence and decreasing his spade club and diamond prevalence. So my, my thought process there is very much just about, again, global frequency for range, then how often does my hand bet? That's always what your flops C bet strategy should be like if you're a studious player. How often is my range betting? How often is my hand betting? Couple of spots here. 10, nine on one table, okay. Again, protocol, eight, nine, three. What frequency does my range want to bet at here? Protocol with sixes, always a call, never a four bet, never a fold, call. Flop to set, nice, more on that later. Okay, range gonna bet about 35% of the time, 40%, hand about that. It's not the best nine, I roll a check, this time I check. Back over to this table, villain bets here, protocol. I will build a little bit of small raise here. I'm gonna raise this hand about 40%. That's my estimate, I do roll it this time. The raise is not going to be very big in this spot. It's just going to be something like this generally. 10, nine, I think we can bet here, 75% or check, I'll usually check. Protocol is to bet 30% here or something like that. I check this time, back over to the set. Let's see what he does, he calls. Pretty good turn card for range. I think protocol in this spot is going to be Probably some all-in, actually, with the double flush draw existing here. I think all-in is fine. Is that going to be my only sizing? Yes. Do I always want to go all-in with these two sixes? Probably. I think I'll just jam here at this SBR and double flush draw. This just becomes good. So we jam. We get called by top set. Oh, dear. Well, let's pray. Pray for me that the six of clubs is the river card. It's not. You didn't pray hard enough, guys. Come on. Come on now. Get the praying game up here. But yeah, overall, I'll go over that hand really quickly, actually, again, because it is a bigger pot just before I wrap up today's video and go away and cry at the result of that hand. So if you've made it this far into the video, thank you so much for sticking around for the full thing. I hope you enjoyed it, and I hope this video has shed some light on what you can be doing in future to actually make sure that you bring your A game to the tables and not your B game, C game, or D game. This was absolute A game poker you saw me playing today. Whenever I ask myself what is my thought process first and then answer the questions that arise from that thought process, I play a lot better than you might see me playing when I'm sluggish or tilted or tired or on stream and not really in the mood for it or something like that. So I hope you can draw inspiration from this video and just take a more professional sports person like mindset to your next session. For everything else from us, you know where to go. It's carrotcorner.com for all of the educational materials that I provide. If you're watching this from June onwards 2022, guess what? The Carrot Poker School is now available as a video course on my website. Head over there and pick it up and get yourself a formal poker education. That's what we're all about on this channel. See you guys for another video very soon. This has been Pete Clark. All the best at the tables and bye-bye for now.